This is one of the fastest CPUs you can get for the Socket 3 platform. And although it has 5x86 written all over it, including a Pentium 75 rating, this CPU does not feature any of the 5th generation modifications we have seen in my previous video, where we tested the Cyrex 5x86, a CPU which definitely deserves more than the AMD CPU in today's video to be called a 5x86. This AMD CPU is nothing else but a 486 with the highest frequency you can get for Socket 3. You have probably seen many of my teasers before and today will be the day when this CPU will fire up its internal registers, the 16KB of level 1 cache and write back mode and all the other parts that make up a 486 CPU once more. So let's get right to the task of straightening the pins of this CPU, which are by far in the worst condition compared to any other CPU I have fixed so far. Many of you said that none of the pins are going to break, but we shall see today. I also want to address one comment that I got multiple times suggesting to heat the pins. Based on my experience trying to remove one of the pins from another AMD CPU, I can tell you that I have not noticed any difference in applying heat. What I achieved was to burn my wooden workboard, but the pins felt unchanged even at this temperature. So I don't think heating the pins will make a difference or make it easier to bend them. At least I couldn't feel a difference, except that it would make working on a ceramic CPU much harder because I would have to wear some sort of protection from the heat. And so far I haven't broken off any pins, except that one pin on a DX2 CPU that suffered from corrosion. But that pin would have probably come off anyway, no matter what other method I would have tried. So we continue to bend pins at room temperature. Today we are facing the ultimate challenge. This poor AMD CPU suffers from severely bent pins. Some of them are even bent at a sharp 90 degree angle. I know it will be extremely difficult to get this CPU back into shape, but I want to try my best to prove the people right who voted for zero broken pins. I picked one of the harder pins right from the start to see what I'm getting myself into. And we are off to a rough start. The 90 degree bend was too much, damaging the base. And now we get a good look at the silver core of the pin. I guess this will not be the last one, considering the condition of the other pins in this area. Of course, we cannot leave partially cracked pins like this, because the exposed metal may be susceptible to corrosion. When we are done with the CPU, we should reinforce those fractures with solder. This will not only protect the exposed metal, but it will also reinforce the pin. But those fractured pins are not the only challenge of this CPU. Some of the pins have multiple twists and others have been shaped into something that closely resembles a hook. There were about 10 pins on this CPU that required extreme caution and extreme measures. I tried my best to straighten those pins using the method I used on all other CPUs, but the wooden tools have only gotten me so far. The rest had to be done using pliers. Of course, I was as careful as I possibly could be. I just needed to get those horrible curves out of those pins. Once this was taken care of, I continued to work on the remaining pins, many of which were similar to the other CPUs and went into place without a lot of effort. However, in those two rows where the pins touch the ceramic, every pin has this small cut at the base, resulting in exposed metal. Every single one of those will require a small amount of solder as reinforcement. While I continue to work in the background, let's explore a few details about this CPU. This AMD CPU is technically the only CPU that would deserve the suffix DX4, because it is the only 486 CPU that allows for internal clock quadrupling. A system bus frequency of 33 MHz and a 4x multiplier brings this CPU to 133 MHz. And although this CPU could compete with a Pentium 75 in integer calculations, its floating point unit is hopelessly inferior to the FPU on a Pentium chip. Nevertheless, this AMD CPU was very popular as an upgrade option for Socket 3 motherboards up to the year 1996. The same year Tomb Raider was released. There are quite a few versions of this CPU that have entered the market. For today, I will focus on models with suffix AD and another letter. To my knowledge, there were four of them. The ADH version shows up in many tables I have seen online, but I could not find any specifics on what makes this CPU different from the other models. The other three versions are ADW, ADY and ADZ, the one we have here today. From an official AMD document, we see that the ADW was meant to run at a maximum case temperature of 55 degrees. The ADZ on the other hand could operate at a temperature of up to 85 degrees. The ADY model, which is also one of the less common 486 CPUs, is missing in this graphic. 
However, I did find information claiming that this model is rated for a temperature of 75 degrees. Other than that, those CPUs seem to be identical. Except that there may be something else that was not meant to be disclosed to the public. I'm not able to verify this information, but someone in a forum post claimed that those CPUs were also meant to be released at different frequencies. The ADW is the 133 MHz version, meant to operate using a 33 MHz system bus and a 4x multiplier. The ADY was the next step up to 150 MHz, achieved by a bus speed of 50 MHz and a multiplier of 3. And the ADZ model, the one we have here today, could be a 160 MHz version, downmarked to a 133 MHz model. Rumor has it that AMD did not release those faster clocked 486 models because their K5 CPU was about to launch, and they did not want to have a competing chip in their product lineup. I think AMD knew that the K5 wouldn't do well in comparison to highly clocked 486 CPUs. The CPU is almost finished. And the good news first. So far no pin has been lost during my work. So, if you agree, then bending the pins back resulted in zero casualties, like many of you expected. However, two pins have been squeezed so much that the original position is offset by a large enough margin that would prevent the CPU from fitting into the CPU socket. With a heavy heart, I will deliberately remove two pins and resolder them to this CPU. I will also not reuse the original pins because they are deformed badly at their bases. Instead, another AMD CPU served as a donor to get two of those shiny golden pins in pristine condition. After reattaching both pins, the CPU was ready to be tested. However, we all want to see if this CPU can fall into a socket like all the other CPUs I have fixed so far. You can pause the video and let me know in the comments if you think that this CPU will fall into the socket without resistance. But let me show you a small trick that will enhance the result a bit more. This is the cover of a broken socket 3, which I will use to adjust the pins further. With a cover placed over the pins, I can see which of the pins may cause issues with the socket on the motherboard. This method also allows me to straighten the badly deformed pins. It is good enough to have the portion of the pins straight that go into the socket. The plastic cover serves as the perfect stencil to give this CPU the final touches. And although this is an extra step that makes the entire project take even more time, it may just give us the extra help we need to get this CPU in the best condition possible. And here's the moment we have all been waiting for. I must admit, I had my doubts about getting this CPU to fall into the socket. And to be honest, it did not after I was done bending the pins. But after using the socket cover as a reference, it was just a matter of aligning the pins a tiny bit more. Now we just need to see if it was worth all this effort. Will this CPU work with its chipped ceramic? The badly mangled pins and all the solder reinforcements? Ladies and gentlemen, we have a working AMD 5x86 133ADZ. In the BIOS, the option to switch between write back and write through level 1 cache, which we have seen when using the Cyrix CPU, is no longer available. But cache check confirms that the AMD CPU is indeed running in write back mode. So, we won't see any benchmarks of this CPU today where the level 1 cache is configured to be operating in write-through mode.
In system information, this CPU scores 286 points. Just a few points ahead of the Cyrex 5X86, which scored 278 points with all enhancements enabled. Considering that the AMD CPU is clocked 33 MHz higher, this result isn't particularly impressive. Disabling the turbo mode slashes the score in half to almost 144 points. In top bench, the disappointment continues. The AMD CPU scores similarly to the Cyrex CPU when its branch prediction is enabled. When all enhancements are enabled, the Cyrex beats the AMD CPU by a small margin. So far, the higher clocked AMD processor doesn't seem to be an upgrade. But let's move on to Doom. And here we can finally see the AMD CPU outperforming the Cyrex CPU. We now score 40 frames per second, 3.5 frames more compared to the Cyrex 5x86, which is an improvement of about 10%. And the final benchmark is PC Player, which finishes with a frame rate of 17.5 frames per second, 1.5 frames better compared to the Cyrex CPU. Although the AMD CPU performs slightly better, I have a feeling that we won't see much of an improvement in Tomb Raider. We still need to rely on our perception and judge how well the game works with a certain CPU. But this will be the final test of Tomb Raider in software mode. The next video will be the preparation for 3D accelerated Tomb Raider on the Socket 3 platform. In case you're asking yourself, but what about the Pentium Overdrive? We will get to this, and there will be a dedicated video once I get the original fan, which is on its way to me. As you can see, Tomb Raider works quite well using the lower resolution. I'm not sure about you, but I think this footage is very similar to the Cyrex 5x86. Large or complex areas still pose a challenge to this CPU, where you will notice slowdowns in rendering performance. Then, it also shouldn't be a surprise to you that higher resolutions are still unplayable. Even if the frame rate may have doubled compared to the Intel DX2 CPUs, it's still too slow. The open area where Lara needs to fight the T-Rex feels very similar to the footage recorded using the Cyrex CPU. Maybe it renders slightly faster, but it is not a significant improvement. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that the ADZ model may have been a model that was supposed to be marketed at 160MHz. And although this is just speculation, let's try to run this CPU at a bus frequency of 40MHz with a multiplier of 4. Without the need for any voltage adjustment, this CPU booted at 160MHz without any issues. And we do get a new Pentium rating of 90 from the BIOS. I understand that many 133MHz models are capable of being overclocked to 160MHz, but I'm still happy that this scrap CPU does it as well. At 160MHz the AMD CPU finally beats any other CPU I have tested so far. System information reports a score of 345 points, clearly beating the Cyrex. Top Bench provides a similar picture. At 364 points the AMD CPU is outperforming any other CPU. Doom did surprisingly well too. At 47.5 frames per second, the AMD CPU is now outperforming the Cyrex CPU by over 10 frames. And finally, PC Player completes with a frame rate of 20.5 frames per second. Again, a significant improvement. You may wonder why the scores do not scale linearly with the increase in CPU frequency. That is most likely due to the increased system bus speed from 33 to 40 MHz. Let's go ahead now and try Tomb Raider with this overclocked AMD CPU. The beginning of the first level seems to be identical to what we have seen at 133MHz. There are smooth animations and the game feels quite playable overall. Larger resolutions, however, are still a no-go. And even though this is the best result we have achieved so far, we still end up with a slideshow of Lara's adventure. Larger areas seem to render a lot better than before. Yes, we still get noticeable slowdowns, but it is much better than anything we have seen before.
And the last test is the scene with a T-Rex. I don't know if you would have expected anything else, but the slow frame rate is still very noticeable. The game runs better on this overclocked AMD CPU compared to any other CPU we have tested so far. But it is still not where we want it to be. In the next video, we are going to restore this Diamond Monster 3D, which suffers from damaged pins and bad solder bridges everywhere. We may end up removing the frame buffer chip to be able to clean the pads properly and straighten the pins. I really hope nobody tried to use this card in its current state. But we will find out if this Diamond Monster 3D is working in the next video, and hopefully we will see Lara rendered in 3DFX glide mode. And this is all I have for you today. I hope you're happy that this AMD CPU is back to life and back in action. If you enjoyed today's content, please like and subscribe. This will help the channel grow. I also want to thank all my Patreon members for their invaluable support. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.